All right, well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning and welcome to our Champions of Change. My name is Roberto Rodriguez. I serve here on the Domestic Policy Council as Special Assistant to President Obama for Education. And it's a real pleasure to welcome each of you here this morning. Uh, those of you that are joining us here in person, as well as those of you who might be joining us online uh, for this program, we have a very special program today honoring our Head Start Champions of Change. Each week, we have the pleasure here at the White House of recognizing a distinguished group of Americans who embodies the President's goal of creating an America built to last. The idea behind Champions of Change is simple. Uh, it began with a vision that the President shared in his State of the Union address last year. Everyone has a story to tell, a lesson to, a lesson to share, and, part, and a part to play in helping to move our country forward and win the future. And the work of strengthening our economy and of opening doors of opportunity for America's families and children is done each and every day in our local communities across rural, suburban, and urban America. Our Champions of Change program gives our administration an opportunity not only to recognize these distinguished individuals, but also to share their ideas and their experiences with the whole country. So over the past year, we've welcomed leaders from fields of, <coughs> ranging from healthcare to entrepreneurship to education. And this week, we're focused on the dedication that America's directors, parents, teachers and family service coordinators in our Head Start and early Head Start programs are doing to make a difference for America's kids and families. For over 45 years, Head Start has been the helping hand for our nation's neediest families and children. It gives nearly one million children the support they need to begin school ready to learn. It guarantees that children see doctors and dentists and are immunized against childhood diseases. It teaches our children to eat healthy meals, it welcomes parents into classrooms and urges them to participate actively in the development of their children and in their local programs. Head Start focuses on the whole child, and we know that decades of solid research shows that Head Start works. Children who participate in Head Start and Early Head Start make critical gains in their vocabulary, in their social, emotional, and health development, and in other developmental areas that are the building blocks that they need to in enter kindergarten ready for success. So in just a moment, I'll be pleased to introduce Secretary Sebelius to share with you our outstanding Head Start Champions of Change. And I encourage each and every one of you here in person and online to visit www.whitehouse.gov backslash champions to learn more about the leaders that we are recognizing and applauding today. And with that, I'm honored to turn our program over to our administrator's outstanding Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Honorable Kathleen Sebelius. <laughs> I just, just want to note the, secre the Secretary has herself been a champion for Head Start, and uh, her leadership is what's made possible the historic steps in our administration to really expand and strengthen Head Start. So thank you so much for joining us today, Madam Secretary. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a great opportunity to celebrate some terrific leaders and a wonderful program. I want to thank Roberto Rodriguez for convening this celebration. Um, Roberto is the special assistant to the president for education. Um, I want to also recognize two great leaders in our department at the uh, Administration for Children and Families, Linda Smith, who is the Deputy um, Assistant Secretary and Interdepartmental Liaison for Early Childhood Development. Mm -hmm. Linda plays a critical role not only at HHS, but between HHS and the Department of Education um, so that we are closely knit together on early childhood issues. And Yvette Sanchez Fuentes, who runs the um, office of Head Start, and they are both terrific. Um, as Roberto said, for nearly five decades, Head Start has changed the lives of more than 28 million children and their families by putting them on a path to succeed in school. Now, the progress was built on a foundation laid by people like Dr. Ed Ziegler, who 
was the founding director of the agency we now call Administration for Children and Families. And he was a driving force behind Head Start in its early days. And I'm sorry Dr. Ziegler couldn't be with us here today, but we see his influence all around us. I want to recognize particularly Dr. T. Barry Brazelton, who's been a tireless advocate for young children, particularly through his vision for early Head Start. And I've been stealing his good ideas for a very long time <laughs> as a mom and as a leader and as a... Thank you. Um, but the deep impact of Head Start over the years is also due to the commitment of countless dedicated teachers, program directors, parents, and principals like the champions here today. When Head Start launched, we had the basic idea that a child's early years were critical. But since then, research has shown us just how true that is. The most rapid development in our children's brains happens in their first five years. That's also when children pick up social, emotional, and early academic skills that they'll carry for the rest of their lives. And as so many of you have shown, day in and day out, children who get the support they need during these early years are the most prepared for kindergarten which means they're the most likely to succeed in early grades and beyond. What we've seen is that early learning programs like Head Start can set off a chain reaction of success that follows children through every stage in their lives. Now, I have to tell you, my first experience in public office was being elected to the Kansas legislature a thousand years ago. But I was the parent of children two and five, so this area of early childhood education has been one of my passions, um, professional and personal, since those very early days. But the power of the work that all of you do is seen each and every day. And that's why the Obama administration has made an historic commitment to early childhood education, starting with Head Start. Through the investments in the Recovery Act, one of the first bills that the President signed into law, we doubled the size of Early Head Start and made Head Start available to 61,000 additional children. So even in some of our country's toughest budgetary times, when we're forced to make so many cuts we don't want to make, we have fought to preserve the funding for those additional Head Start kids. But we're not just investing more resources in our early childhood system. We're also putting a new focus on quality. We're implementing teacher-based training that puts the best evidence-based strategies in every Head Start classroom. We're working with Head Start programs to engage parents in their children's educational success and to create better connections between Head Start programs and elementary schools. And we're also taking steps to evaluate Head Start and early Head Start programs against a set of clear, high expectations and hold programs accountable if they aren't meeting the grade. Under the new policies, if a program isn't meeting benchmarks, it must compete against other entities for funding. We believe competition will lead the current grantees and new applicants to take a step back to evaluate how they can deliver the best high quality program to children and to innovate constantly in their classrooms. The first set of applications under the new competition system is due this summer, and we look forward to reviewing them. Now, we aren't finished working to improve Head Start. If we want to, as the President says, out-educate and out-compete the rest of the world, we have to continue to look for new ideas and best practices. And that's why we've recently announced plans to test a new approach in five communities. Organizations, that want to develop a comprehensive birth to five Head Start program will have the chance to apply for both Head Start and Early Head Start funds at once through a coordinated application. And our goal is to see if this fosters new innovative models that better integrate Head Start and Early Head Start programming, while recognizing that children in some communities may be better served by organizations that focus on either independently. So taken together, these efforts have a clear goal, to help every child in America reach his or her full potential. Now we're here today not just to recognize those of you standing up here and sitting 
in front, who bring us closer to that goal, but also to hear from you. We want to know what works and what doesn't. How can we continue to support and strengthen Head Start? How can we support early education more broadly? We're doing, taking some new steps across federal government. But we know that what ultimately makes an early education program succeed are the tireless work people on the ground do every day. Those teachers with the magic ability to make a four-year-old sit and focus. The mentors who spend their free time honing lesson plans. The site supervisors who work long hours to make sure that all their kids get checkups and vaccinations they need. This commitment runs through so many Head Start programs across the country, and it shines so brightly in the champions of change here today. So I want to close by thanking and congratulating them individually. And as I read your name, I hope that you will stand, and those of you who are standing might wave your hand <laughs> and be recognized. Today's Head Start champions of change are Dr. T. Barry Brazelton. Professor of Pediatrics <laughs> Emeritus Harvard <laughs> Medical School. Ms. Karen Calhoun, Director of Tulsa Educare. <laughs> Ms. Renette Gosen, Director of Sisseton. Sisseton. <laughs> Wapetan Oyate, Head Start and Early Head Start. <laughs> Rosemary Greer, Head Start teacher, mentor, coach at Baraga Houghton Kiwane Child <laughs> Development Board. <laughs> Roxanne Hiller. Site Supervisor and Teacher, Resource <laughs> Connection, Head Start Program. Ms. Lori Pittman, Family Support Coordinator, Puget Sound Educational Service District. <laughs> Dr. Rory Sipp, Director, Osuleo Learning, Clark County. Ms. Joy Trejo, Senior Director of Early Childhood and Family Service Programs, the Campana Center. <laughs> and Hileko, I'm sorry, Villa Verde, Early Head Start Teacher, Southwest Human Development, Early Head Start and Head Start. Ms. Lourdes Villanueva, Villanueva, <laughs> Director of Farm Worker Advocacy, Redlands Christian Migrant Association. <laughs> and Ms. Ginger West, Parent, Learning Center for Families, Early Head Start. This is a terrific group of champions who I think not only epitomizes some of the best of the best, but also the range of talents and skills, parents, teachers, mentors, program directors, service administrators involved in this critical program that is lifting up our children across this country and changing the lives each and every day. We thank you for making sure that not only the children whose lives you touch have a better future, but by doing so, that we have a more prosperous America. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. Can we all give uh, our Secretary of Health and Human Services Thank her for her presence today here uh, and also for her ongoing leadership uh, uh, 
uh, to strengthen and expand Head Start. So with that, we're going to get to the heart of this program, which is really uh, having a chance to hear from our Head Start champions of change. So I'd like to invite our first panel to stay here, and our second panel of champions will exit for the moment, uh, and uh, we'll hear from them uh, momentarily uh, in the second part of our program. And to kick us off, I'd like to welcome to the podium our Director of the Office of Head Start at the Department so of Health and Human Services, uh, Administration for Children and Families, uh, Yvette Sanchez Fuentes. Uh, <laughs> and Yvette is really our guiding light uh, for our administration in the Head Start program. She previously served as Executive Director of the National Migrant and Seasonal Head Start Association and has years of experience working uh, with our Head Start uh, children and families uh, across the country. Thank you so much, Yvette, and uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Um, so I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Office of Head Start. And I have been across this country, and I've heard many stories from many voices and in many ways. And so I'm humbled that today we get to hear directly from 10 champions so that you can hear their story and the work that they do every day on behalf of the children and the families that we serve. So we're going to start out with a couple of questions. Um, and we talked a little before. So we are uh, trying to you know, organize this as best we can. But one of the pieces that we've focused on a lot um, during my tenure is knowing that parent involvement is a cornerstone of Head Start. But what we've also been trying to do over the last couple of years is to really expand the definition and start to talk about family engagement and families coming in every shape and every size and with every different type of need. So we wanted to start off with our parents today um, who, who started as parents and who now, as, as you've heard, are working with the program to tell us a little bit, I'm going to start with Lori, to tell us a little bit about how the program has empowered them and specifically to talk to us about what's one thing that she's doing today that perhaps she wouldn't have done without the support and the experience and Head Start. Hi. Um, I started as a Head Start parent. Um, 19 years ago, and um, my, I guess I wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for Head Start. <laughs> um, Head Start is parent engagement, family engagement is really my thing. Uh, I enjoy the children, I enjoy the classroom, but I know that the long-term future of our children is based in their parents, and based in their parents feeling worthy and valuable and honored as part of, of, of our communities. And so um, while I was a parent and, in, and on policy council and all of the things that um, become available, it became really obvious to me that what makes a change for folks is opportunity. Opportunity that has support, that has some support attached. Um, one of the things I remember in my first policy council meeting, I introduced myself as just a mom. And somebody there said to me, who's now a dear friend, oh, you are so much more than a mom. And that, changed, that statement changed my life, as, as well as the one from my family support worker who's, who said, you live on that amount of money? <laughs> <laughs> and you have six kids? <laughs> she said, you can do anything. And I remember both of those moments, and those have been the things that have really encouraged me to make sure other families have the opportunities that I had. Um, did you want me to say one thing? Proudest moment? We'll save that for the end. Okay. All right. We're going to end on a good note. And I'm, I'm going to sort of look over to Rory now, because Rory, if you had an opportunity um, to visit the website, has quite a fascinating story. And he actually started as a Head Start child in a local program. So this is kind of a big question, Roy, but tell us how Head Start changed your life. OK. <laughs> yeah. And um, for the sake of time, I would be remiss if I did not say thank you so much to Aaron Lieberman. He is the CEO and founder of Ocelero Learning. And so he is here today with me, and I just want to thank him. I also want to thank my Ocelero family and my um, real family, who is actually watching. Um, and so I just wanted to, to say that I would be remiss if I didn't do that. but. I would try to s summarize my experience with Head Start by starting in 1990, 
six. 1996, it was um, a really tough time for me. I would say I had lost pretty much everything. Um, I had lost my mom, my grandmother, all of my, um, I would say, family members within my immediate household, and that was a tough time for me. However, I realized that there was this one program that I could still reach out to, and it was the Head Start program. But for some reason, Head Start is and has always been the best kept secret. So I did know how to locate the Head Start program. So a friend of mine, he was actually working as a teacher assistant in one of the local Head Start programs in Birmingham, Alabama. And so he told me, you should reach out to Head Start. They, they can provide you some assistance. So I said, well, I don't have anything but a high school diploma. I don't, ha I don't have a degree or any type of qualifications. So I went to the Head Start program, and sometimes it takes a while to get in and get a hold of people. So I was persistent. I called every day. I didn't want to have just an application in with them. I called every day, and they thought I was crazy, but I was <laughs> ambitious. I meant I was getting into that program. And so I started in the Head Start program in Birmingham, and they gave me an opportunity that I don't think I otherwise would have had. Not to say that my family um, wasn't supportive, supportive of me. My family has been always supportive, supportive of me. However, we didn't have a college fund put up. We didn't have anything that would really lay the foundation for my future educationally. So I started with a CDA, a Child Development Associate credential, and I thought I was the stuff. I thought I was really doing something <laughs> big. But it was that one credential that was the platform for me, and it propelled me to go back and get my associate's degree, my bachelor's and master's wow. degree, and my doctoral degree. And, and I just want to say that it was Head Start that not only inspired me, but it was Head Start that financially supported me. And so that's one thing that I can say that Head Start has really done for me. In regards to family engagement, things have changed from when I was um, helping my child and helping my nieces and nephews who are, are, who are all beneficiaries of the Head Start program. I don't recall um, anyone just saying to me, you need to be present in this classroom. Um, but I heard um, um, a friend of mine, I also hear Aaron say oftentimes that we have not found out how to do Head Start without the humans. That's right. And so the humans include the parents and the children. And so parent engagement is essential to, to this thing that I've said that I'm going to make it my lifelong mission to hunt down. And it's that the achievement gap, and Lori, you said the opportunity gap. Right. Achievement gap, opportunity gap, whichever one we would want to call it, I'm going to hunt it down and I'm going to close it, but I cannot do it without the families. And so that's one thing that I would just like, like to say that I'm thankful for in regards to the Head Start program. Excellent, thank you. So sort of building on this theme of the humans and the children and the families, we often talk about Head Start as a local program. And so, Roxanne, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how your program functions in the local community and how you all work to strengthen partnerships to better support children and families. So I have a great professional learning commu community that I am a part of. I'm integrated into a school campus where our families and children are part of a very small rural community. For us, not only are we taking the child into our program, but we again are building the whole family engagement process. So when families enter into our program, our goal is to strengthen that whole foundation to make the children school ready and successful mm -hmm. in the years to come. And so we have been able to do that through the different opportunities in our program, our policy council, um, and just trainings that we offer. Let's read together a raising a reader program and stuff that installs that into the families building school success with their children. That's great, thank you. And thank you for taking us into school readiness. <laughs> so I think um, you hear us talk a lot, so the Head Start folks in the room will hear that we talk a lot about school readiness, and the secretary mentioned it in her remarks. It is one of the critical pieces that we are focusing on. And But with that, though, we also acknowledge that in Head Start, the demographics have changed a lot. Um, Head Start's diversity has grown tremendously, not just in the languages that we serve, but I often like to say that Head Start is in every community, in every county, in every migrant camp, and in many tribal reservations. And so Angelica and I were talking a little bit about the diversity in the programs and how, as a teacher, she helps to support those pieces every day while supporting school readiness. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, I think what I want to start off saying is um, my biggest thing is the parent-child relationship. Yeah. Um, and there's so much research out there for those of us in the early childhood field that states how important that is and how that gets our kids ready for their future, mm -hmm. their educational endeavors. Um, and so me as a teacher, <laughs> in my classroom, I have a Burmese refugee family. I have Somali refugee families, and I have children who um, their first language is Spanish. And so lucky for me, <laughs> I can speak Spanish in the classroom, but I don't know how to speak Burmese, yeah. and I don't know how to speak you know, any other languages. <laughs> so um, we have uh, staff on hand that are culturally relevant that come into the classroom to support us for anything that we need, talking with the families, um, going with us on home visits so that we can provide those, not only the family needs, but also the individual child needs. And so my biggest thing is, I always say this to everybody I know, but you can't build a house without foundation. And I feel as a teacher, we're providing that foundation for them to go along on their educational journey. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Joy. Joy has uh, been around for a while <laughs> and has been supporting the work that we do here. Um, as a champion, Joy, what message would you pass on about the importance of Head Start in this country? Well, given the fact that Head Start serves over a million children a day, um, the importance is clear. Um, these children, these vulnerable, from vulnerable at-risk families need what we have to give them. Their families need what we have to give them every day. And when I see the benefit in a child who comes to class learning how to speak English for the first time and then all of a sudden six months in is bilingual and their parents are amazed and their parents feel supported and their parents feel a part of the Head Start family that we've created, it's clear that everything we do every day is really for them. Um, the staff and the work that they do to benefit their own education and to bring back you know, innovative ideas is all for the children and families that we serve. So the most important message is that without Head Start, what would these children have to help propel them further into the 21st century to allow them the, the not luxury, but the necessity of a quality early child education and ability to develop in a way that allows they and their parents to enter the world confident, to enter the, to the world feeling like they have the ability to do anything that they need to do. And I hear that from my parents a lot, which is the most, and that's gonna be my proudest moment, but the most gratifying thing about working for Head Start is hearing the families, the parents talk about, even in the sh a short amount of time that they've been with us, everything that they've gained from the program, just even knowledge about health and nutrition, or understanding how to navigate the school system, and actually understanding the concept of school readiness, because a lot of people in this country still feel that early childhood education is something that doesn't really make sense to them. So helping them understand how important the work is that we do with children zero to five to get them ready to go to school, ready to learn, but not only ready to learn, but with the comprehensive services we provide, ready to thrive, that's what I think is the most important message. Excellent. Thank you. You're school welcome. readiness. You know, we often hear that folks who come into Head Start grow to love Head Start. And I think some of you have often heard my colleague Michelle Brown say, once you, you know, bleed Head Start, you always bleed Head Start. So, right, Lori mentioned yes. this too. So, okay, Lori, can you tell us a little bit about where this, we've heard some of your story about how you've grown from a parent into a staff person, but tell us a little bit about where that passion for Head Start comes from. Um, I think the passion for Head Start for me comes from when I see parent. Parents come and they often come bringing their children because they want good things for them. They're not always sure what they're getting when they sign up for Head Start, but they know it's a good thing. And then when I watch them grow and they become advocates, and they become strong, <coughs> strong advocates, they reach out. Um, in our state, we have a program called Washington State Parent Ambassadors, and um, which I am honored to um, be the program manager. It's in partnership with our agency and our state association. And when those parents realize they can change, they can change the laws, they can change the things that support them families, it's like a fire. And they start glowing and burning and then it lights people around them. And so that's where my passion comes from. I stand back and watch them and it's amazing. That's great. 
it's amazing to see them. And we talk about a platform of change a lot. Um, we talk about what we need to change. Um, we, we put a lot of hope in, our, in the administration and other folks to expand Head Start. And what I always say is we need them working at the top, but our parents are going to be what brings it to the country and makes the biggest change. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> It comes from right there. It comes from right there. <laughs> comes from right there. Roxanne, tell us a little bit about your passion for Head Start. You have a great story, too. Um, well, I am just, I believe in taking the whole entire family. And so for me, when the children enter into my classroom every day, it's not just about them, but it's about their whole entire family. So my goal first is to create an atmosphere that wants children and families to be a part of my program, for them to know that they're safe and that they're wanted inside of my room. And so it's often nice for me when the children come and they talk about, it doesn't matter where they are, where the families are, or where they came from, that every single one of them are accepted and that um, as the children come into the program, that we share those experiences with the families that either in the morning or at pickup time, we give them a piece so we can also help them learn what it looks like to work with their children and to be successful. That's excellent, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. So I'm gonna have one final question for these guys and then we just sort of decided how we were gonna end our panel, but so as champions and as national leaders, because clearly there are hundreds of people watching you all, what is sort of one or two hopes for Head Start as a program as we move forward? Should we start with Joy, make sure. it easier? Well, my hope is that we continue not only to provide the incredibly high quality services that we're able to provide, but that we are able to continue to expand and that we're able to get the secret out about Head Start and that how the, yes. the work that really needs to be done is, about, is comprehensive for these families more than anything else. Ms. Yvette, I just want to, I, I want to thank you so much for um, choosing me as one of the champions. So I forgot to say that in my initial. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, and thanks to the administration. <laughs> but, but on our conversation, when you, you spoke with me um, a couple of days ago, you mm -hmm. said you thought I was on vacation. Um, I do not vacate. I cannot. <laughs> I do not feel that I should vacate when there are thousands of children on the waiting list who know about Head Start and do not have access to Head Start because there's, there is not enough funding in our local programs to expand to provide those services to those children. And so one thing that I'm hopeful for is that we have enough monies um, that can come from the federal level down to our local programs so that more children like me and my family, they can take advantage of and experience the Head Start program like I have. Um, kind of the piggyback off of that, um, <clears throat> for me, is just to, to see it expand and to, and to have more people realize the importance of early childhood education and, and to value it um, and to see that we need more to go towards that because we could save ourselves so much money in the long run if we're providing it now. So Great. So we are going to end our panel with um, each of our panelists telling, telling you about their greatest Head Start moment. Um, and we wanted to sort of take a little bit of time for this, but they also know there's a little bit of a time constraint, but that's okay. So Lori, we'll start with you. This is excessively challenging for me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know it's really hard because I have my own personal moments. Yeah. I have moments of thousands of families that I have the honor to support and serve. And then there's my parent ambassadors. And so I'm going to choose a parent ambassador moment, but I would choose all 80 of those parent ambassadors. So you guys at home don't. <laughs> um, last June, we brought a few parent ambassadors here to Washington State and had the opportunity to meet with Roberto Rodriguez. One of those parent ambassadors, his name is Rob. He was a felon for 14 years. Um, and. Um, then he had a baby, and he's ended up raising that baby on his own. Um, he's a great leader in his community now for parent involvement. And probably my proudest moment was when he stood here in the, in the White House in his dad's shoes, who had recently passed away, and said, 
imagine me, I'm in the White House in my dad's shoes. <clears throat> and then we ended up at a hearing on early childhood where Patty Murray talked about his story and he got a standing ovation um, in, this, in the hearing and that's not very common I hear. <laughs> and I could do nothing but cry because he's, had, he's done an amazing thing. So I would say that's one of my proudest moments. That's excellent, thank you, thank you. Roxanne? The proudest moment for me is when I see families come in that have several different struggles. They perhaps are homeless, don't have transportation to the center, are looking for the different medical and dental needs for their children, and that we have been able to empower them to begin to move forward. And so I also had a family that has been very important to me. When they came to our program, they were using drugs and, you know, weren't quite all together. And through me taking that time and building with her and talking with her, she now volunteers inside my classroom. She's um, went to a rehab, you know, she's, she's made herself and her children's lives better. Mm -hmm. And so the, when I see moments like that and families like that that are taking our wisdom and wanting to change and to grow, it makes me extremely proud to be a Head Start employee. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Angelica? <laughs> Um, I think my proudest moment as a teacher, um, just recently I had um, a mom in my classroom. She's from Mexico, she has a degree in um, psychology, and she just, she, I guess her English skills weren't as, she wasn't so confident in her English skills, and she would come into my classroom and she would speak to me with very limited English, and I would tell her, Luce, Luce, I'm like, your English is getting so good, like, you need to you need to like apply for a job with, with us because she talked about how she wanted to work with us. She wanted to do child development work and work with Head Start. And I said, just apply. Just just apply and see what happens. Like the worst they could tell you is we don't have a position right now. And she did and she got the position. And so she's a child development associate at one of our other sites. So yeah. <laughs> So that was my proudest moment as a teacher and being able to reach out to her and encourage her to go to the next level and you know make sure that she's an advocate for her child. Yeah. Good so. job, thank you, Angelica. Yep, Rory. Um, most memorable. I had this one little kid in my classroom. He was um, he found that using profanity was um, <laughs> he could be he could be reinforced um, by using profanity and um, he engaged in a lot of aggressive behaviors and so forth and so. For some reason, he and I bonded, um, and after us bonding for a couple of weeks in the Head Start program, he looked up at me one day and said, you want to be my dad? And I said, I can't be your dad, but I can um, certainly spend some more time with you. And so he started visiting my home, and I spent a lot of time with him. He is now 17 years old, wow. doing very well in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, so that's most memorable for me. Thanks, Rory. Joy? Well, one of my most memorable and proud moments is of a staff member that we still have with us. Um, she knows who she is if she's listening. The first time she walked in my office, she walked in with a tiny, tiny baby in her baby Bjorn. And she was in the throes of having an infant, and she had just applied to be our bus aide. And she had said to me, okay, well, I just had this baby, and I'm going to be your bus aide. I'm going to be a great bus aide, but I'm also going to get my BA. I said, oh, okay, sounds good. Do you want me to hold the baby? <laughs> do you do that? And so, you know, fast forward a couple of years, you know, I helped proctor exams for her that she had to take. Um, and then one day she walked in my office with her four-year-old, Keanu, cutest kid in the whole world, and said, I just wanted to give you an invitation to my graduation and to thank you for the support that you gave me. Of course, I cried, and then Keanu asked me why I was crying, and then I had to, you know. But the proudest moment was seeing her through everything, um, through having to start college, drop out of college, have a baby, have her child in early Head Start and Head Start, and then transition to, into kindergarten as a successful kindergartner. She is an incredible person, but she is just one of 309 families that we serve every day that have the same kind of drive and ambition exactly. for themselves and their children. So I'm proud of her every day, and I think it's a little embarrassing for her, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you. Thank you all for sharing your stories and for being so honest. I know that folks really appreciate it. Um, and sort of based on the family piece, I just want to say thank you to my family who is in the back because without them, I can do the work that I do every day. So. <laughs> Thank the panel one more time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Yvette, and thank you, panelists, for the uh, inspiring um, uh, stories and for really sharing with us the change that you're leading uh, in lives around the country. So we appreciate that. Uh, I'm very honored now to be able to bring uh, up to the podium one of our distinguished champions of change today, T Dr. T. Barry Brazelton. And Dr. Brazelton is the professor of pediatrics emeritus at Harvard Medical School and one of our nation's foremost authorities on pediatrics and child development. He's written 40 books and more than 200 scholarly papers on pediatrics, child development, and parenting, as well as developed the groundbreaking National Behavioral Assessment Scale that's now used worldwide uh, to recognize the physical and, neuro and neurological responses of newborns. So throughout his uh, career, Dr. Brazelton has been a key advisor on early childhood development work. Uh, he's advised past administrations. Uh, when I was serving with the late Senator Ted Kennedy, he was a key advisor to our Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. He's helped guide enactment of important pieces of legislation like the Family and Medical Leave Act and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and he frequently testifies before Congress. Uh, most importantly, he is one of our nation's greatest teachers about the importance of our babies and our toddlers uh, and the relationships that they build with adults around them. So we're so honored to have him, and thank you so much. Let, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Breston. Thank you. And I, I want to thank S Secretary Sebelius for her interest in all that we're doing. She's such an advocate for what we're up to. And I want to thank Yvette and uh, Linda and all of the people on this panel. I'm proud to be honored as a White House Champion of Change and thrilled to share this distinction with men and women who put Head Start to work for all of our children every day. I want to thank President Obama and his administration for this recognition and for doing more for babies and young children than any other president in the last 40 years. I don't think he gets enough recognition for that either. And I, uh, nearly 50 years ago, I collaborated with Head Start's funding fathers, Ed Ziegler and Julius Richmond, helped to help build a comprehensive early education program, giving every child a chance to make the American dream come true for that child and for all of us. Today, thanks to the Obama administration, more children than ever are participating in Head Start, fulfilling the bipartisan vision backed by Republicans and Democratic administrators alike. Science has shown that, as a result, these children will be significantly more likely to graduate from college, enter, uh, enter, enter college, stay out of trouble, uh, join a globally competitive workforce, and serve as contributed members to our society. Yet despite what we know about the long-term benefits of early education's boost for early brain development, too many Head Start eligible children still aren't funded for a chance at this life-changing, Ameri-strengthening program. For too many decades, we've missed out on the opportunity to invest early in our children. And now we're paying the price with our e economy 
national security and safety. For example, on every indicator of educational achievement, the U.S. lags behind every other developing nations. Uh, in 2020, there will be 123 million high-pay, high-skilled jobs. Unless we do better, there will only be 50 million, less than half, Americans qualified to fill them. The rest will be outscored to places like China and India. According to a report by, the, by a group of retired generals, 70% of our young men and women are not uh, eligible to, to serve our country because they aren't smart enough, aren't healthy enough, or both. Police chiefs and sheriffs say that spending time on crime uh, is out of control. There are more people in prison in the U.S than any other country in the world. Too many of our public high schools are dropout factories. Too many children uh, on our streets at age 15 with no skills are prison bound. And it'll cost us at least three million, three times more to imprison them to, and to educate them. The only way to stop this vicious cycle from dropout factory to prison and to stop this drain on our economy is before it starts. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience tell us that the highest return, return on investment is when the brain is growing its fastest in the first years of life. Common sense tells us that, that a savings of $17 or more for every dollar invested in the first years uh, are uh, our, uh, in quality early education is an opportunity not to be missed. Yet where we are today is the legacy of decades of missed opportunities. The Obama administration has labored hard in the worst economic circumstances since the Great Depression and to an even less count, uh, constructive political climate to turn around the sorry situation it stepped into. One of its greatest accomplishments has been to galvanize the public will to open head start to 61,000 additional children. But we can and must do more. I'm 94 years old and I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> A lot more work to do. That's why I developed the, the Braselton Touchpoint Center to help me keep on going. And once I've done all I can to, re, to march forward with this mission to ensure that all children grow up to become adults who can cope with adversity, strengthen their communities, engage in active participants in civic life, steward our fragile planet's limited resources, and nurture the next generation to be prepared to do the same. The Braselton Touchpoint Center has taken the decades of scientific research on babies and young children that I've been proud to advance to many millions of parents, uh, to Touchpoint's communities in more than 40 states and 90 tribal, nation, tribal nations, and its role as lead agency for the Office of Head Start's National Center for Parent, Family, and Community Engagement to hundreds of Head Start programs around the country. We partner with child care centers, preschools, pediatric clinics, and hospitals, and every institution that serves children to ensure that every opportunity for long-term success is leveraged to its fullest. Across this nation, that approach is empowering families and community members to work together on behalf of the dream that we all share for our children and our country's future. Using everything we now know about how children's behavior, children's brains development, 
so that they're going to grow up strong, healthy, and ready to give back. We all have a lot to do, but we can do it together. Thank you for all of this. Thank you so much, Dr. Brazelton, for that uh, inspiring talk. Um, and uh, with that, we are going to go ahead and move on to the uh, second uh, panel of our Head Start champions. If uh, I could ask uh, our second panel and uh, Linda Smith to join us. There's Linda. Linda. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome our Deputy Assistant Secretary and Interdepartmental Liaison for Early Childhood Development within the Department of Health and Human Services at the Administration for Children and Families, Linda Smith. And Linda provides overall policy coordination and direction for Head Start, Early Head Start, the Child Care and Development Fund. Her office is really the focal point of early childhood education and development policy uh, at the federal level for our administration. She previously re uh, led the National Association of Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies and was a great colleague and friend for a long time uh, with the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Uh, and thank you so much, Linda, for joining us and take us away. Okay, no problem. Um, it's interesting to note I was, I'm going to actually date myself when I, I begin this panel because my experiences with Head Start really date back, and Dr. Brazelton probably almost as long as yours, because I volunteered with the Head Start program on the Flathead Reservation in 1967 when they first opened it on, on, the, on the reservation, and I was a volunteer during the summer when I went home from college. And so it's been an amazing odyssey to see the changes. And before I actually get started, I do want to give a shout out to Dr. Ziegler, who couldn't be with us here today. But I do know because his wife is technology savvy, they've assured me that he's going to be tuning in. And so I wanted to <laughs> say thank you also to, to Dr. Ziegler. So I'm going to introduce our panel and we'll um, have a, a good conversation here. I think we've got some very interesting folks here who've spent a lot of time, and I th think my other thought on this is I, as you know, I came from the Defense Department early on, and they, where we had the slogan, once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, to Yvette's comment, once a Head Start member, always a Head Start member. I think that is very true of Head Start. So with me here on this panel today is, is Ms. Karen Calhoun, who is the director of the Tulsa Educare Program. Right here. Right here, next to me. Okay. Uh, Ray, uh, Ms. Rayetta Gosen, who is the director, and I'm going to try this, but um, I'll <laughs> see if I can get it out. The Sisseton Wapiti Oyate Head Start and Early Head Start Program. Yes. That, how close? Yes. Okay, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ms. Rosemary Greer, who is a Head Start teacher and mentor coach at the Baraga Houghton Kanawi Child Development Board. And I I think I'm close. Keweenaw. It's Keweenaw. Keweenaw, okay. Um, Ms. Lourdes Villanueva, who is director of the Farm Workers Migrant, uh, Farm Worker Advocacy Redlands Christian Migrant Association. And finally, thank you, Ginger. <laughs> Ginger West, uh, who is a parent with the Learning Center for Families, uh, the Families Early Head Start program. And I want to actually start by uh, my first question that I want to pose to the panel is what has drawn you to the Head Start mission? And why are you still here? And I'm going to start with Ginger on this one because, uh, Ginger, um, basically, how long have you been with Head Start now? Um, six years. Six years and, and hanging in there. And I think the interesting thing about Ginger's background is that Ginger started her as a child in, that was in Head Start, correct? Early Head Start. Early Head Start and is continuing to stay with the program despite the fact that her child has moved on as a parent. So Ginger, tell us a little bit about your background and what drew you to Head Start, why you stay. Um, I was, my child as an infant and was born with Down syndrome and they came directly to the hospital and they said there's these programs for you. And when I first was in the program, I didn't know what was going on about parent committee and all this stuff. When, when I went to my first parent committee, I got on the policy council <laughs> and from the policy council, it just steamrolled. I did every, every subcommittee there could possibly be. 
Then I became liaison to the board of directors. And then I was also a member of the Utah Head Start Association. So I traveled for that. And I just stayed on the board of directors after my child graduated. And I just go head start. I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. And Lourdes? Um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about your background, too, because you've been with Head Start, what, 30 years? Almost 30 years, actually as an employee, but at about 30 years or more, uh, because I also started as a parent. Uh, and again, I think like many, we just went because, oh, this is a wonderful program and for my children are going to be safe, because again, coming from a farm worker community, it is not just about getting an education, it's about keeping children safe. Mm -hmm. Because if, you, if they are not in a center, then they are out in the field. And yes, it is illegal. And yes, there's laws and rules. But reality is reality. If you don't have a choice, you have to do what you have to do. Uh, so it was just, here's my children. And you know, then I think in a week's time, I saw that I have three very energetic children. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw that teachers were keeping up to 10 children very nicely, quietly, and they did everything that they were asked to do. And I'm like, these people know magic, and I have to learn it. <laughs> so I started volunteering. And before long, the first year, I was volunteer of the year. And just like, um, over here, they say you just start, and then you just can't leave. Yeah. Ginger yeah. started. And um, so then the following, uh, the following year, then I was also involved in all of the parent groups that there are to, you know, to be involved with. Uh, so then when, when my children went on to school, I mean, I took that everything, again, everything that I learned in Head Start, I used it all the way through. I'm talking about from making sure that my children were enrolled in the right courses in high school, because again, uh, in some of the rural areas, it is still difficult to make sure that our children get the opportunities that, that they deserve. And that's where I think that Head Start is just the most powerful tool for parents because it is not just a one shot, one year, one semester, whatever. I mean, this is something for life that you learn and you take on because then, you know, finally, I might, it's funny, but my title actually was from my executive director who said, this is what you do, so might as well give you a title of that <laughs> because, I mean, it is just one of those things. And so now I'm just honored uh, to be able to do it for a living for the families that we serve today. That the challenges are still the same, um, and sometimes in many cases even worse. Because a lot of the families, migrant farm worker families that we serve now are in this country undocumented. So that's a big hurdle. And then number two, the languages that they speak. Yes, I speak Spanish, but it's no longer enough because families come in speaking dialect, and it's always uh, having to find a way to make sure that families feel welcome, because there is a lot for them to learn as well, not just the children. Well said. Mm -hmm. Renata, what about you? What drew you to the Head Start community? Well, um, I was a Head Start um, student um, when I was growing up in, in a little community on the reservation. Um, and it, it really um, wasn't as good of an experience for me because I was used to be growing up um, on the reservation, being able to do all kinds of things outside and um, play was kind of inhibited for me. I could go in the coolies and I lived out in the country where there's vast opportunities for exploration and things like that. And then when I got to Head Start, it was a little bit... Um, Biting for me as well, <laughs> and um, I wasn't able to just play freely like I was used to, and um, it wasn't a good fit for me. But um, so my parents didn't make me go every day. Um, <laughs> eventually, I was probably the first Head Start dropout on my reservation. <laughs> um, but um, through that experience, I went um, I went to college and I graduated with a bachelor's in early childhood or child development family science and then when I came back to head to my reservation um, Head Start just started so um, it just it was a really good fit and um, and my Head Start experience although it was a little bit negative for me um, 
and that's just personally for myself with the, with the, um, the constrictions that I had experienced as, as a four-year-old. I really wanted to make sure that Head Start wasn't constricting and um, gave children and value children as in having an enormous potential. I think that's one of the most important lessons that we all learn in life mm -hmm. is that, you know, we learn from the, the way things happened with us and that we want to improve them yes. for our children. That's Ex really Exactly. Great. And so I, I started as a teacher and then I went and I became the education manager and then eventually I was the, I am the director and I'm able to um, really be able to um, help people see that children are valued and that there is that respect and, um, the sacred act of learning and seeing children as sacred and promoting that um, in our Head Start centers and giving them those opportunities to explore to their full potential. Good, so. good for you. Yeah. Rosemary, what about you? Mm -hmm. What drew you to the Head Start program? Well, I had early experience in the public school systems and um, when we had our family of two children, I left the system for uh, left teaching um, as I knew it then. Uh, to raise our children to be an accessible parent, you know, for about f four or five years. And when I wanted to get back into education, um, I started taking a look at Head Start because being a, a, a new parent then, I saw life in a different way. So I became first a home visitor and did the work as a home visitor from zero to three years old. And then I went and moved into the classroom, and I, I've been in the classroom for many years, and I'm also a, a mentor coach now too. So you know, kind of a full circle in that respect. That's amazing because I do see, think we see a theme here in what people are saying to us in the connection with parenting parents and mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. as a, and it's a real foundation, a solid core of what Head Start really is about, is sort of that whole parent, that whole parent piece. The reason we're really here today is is about change and and where you know sort of what are we championing in terms of change and the future of Head Start. So I want to switch now, and and go first to um, to Karen and and have you say what is sort of your vision for the future of Head Start and what do you where do you think we go next with this? I think one of the things that probably everybody in the room would agree is most important would be relationships and partnerships. And although Head Start's based on partnerships, everybody probably could do a better job at even sharing resources and funding and really get more in depth every day with deeper partnerships. Um, in Tulsa and in our Educare sites, we share um, with Tulsa Public Schools, they give us the grounds to build our early childhood facilities on. We share professional development we share um, transition. I mean, we really are in each other's business. It doesn't matter who gets the paycheck or where people come from. Um, staff members sometimes all say, is that an OU employee, University of Oklahoma employee, or is that one of mine? You know, I mean, it's really, really integrated. So I think partnerships is really a big piece. Partnership with staff, really having them sit down and do a reflective practice, setting their goals and making, um, working together with them, open, honest dialogue with staff, partnerships with families, really, um, I mean, we really set goals with the families, and I think that really, not, not us telling the parents what we're going to do for parent education, the parents and us sitting down and deciding where are we going with this, what do we together want to do as um, uh, to that level, working together with the community as um, where are we going to go as a partnership in the community all together, not really mattering who gets the credit. But I, So I think partnerships would probably be the, the way that I would focus on. Yeah. And Renetta, what about you in terms of you're a director of a program. What do you see as the, you know, sort of the, the future? What, where are we headed? The future? Um, I'd like to see a lot um, children being valued as um, the value of children and how they learn and giving them the opportunities to do so. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is our, um, our outdoor and play, play environment where it's a natural play environment. Um, so seeing the value in those kinds of things and, make, and building on um, what children know and how they learn through natural play is part of one of the things that we've been working on because we believe the environment is 
is a third teacher, so that should be just as enriching, and it's a valued part of our, our curriculum. So seeing that, we expand that out into the outdoor play, and um, building those, those rich environments in which children are, are valued as learners, and teachers are researchers, and we're always out there documenting and getting them really, that's part of school readiness too, and preparing them. And then in addition to that, um, in tribal communities, we have a real big challenge with the um, language um, preservation and maintenance. So um, I believe that that can be incorporated within our programs too. And um, finding those teachers and those core people in our communities that are, are, are the experts in the language has kind of been a challenge for some of us because we do have very few fluent speakers left on some reservations. So it is a challenge, but incorporating all of that in the natural playground and valuing children and how they learn, um, all of that is really important and respectful. What can we call children wakayaja, and that means sacred, sacred beings. So um, valuing them as that and helping them to become um, successful in school is really important to Head Start. Well, I think you bring up one thing that's really important, and I just this morning came from the, the opening of the, the national research meeting that's going on, and the theme is around diversity, and I think one of the things in the future of Head Start, it, it's already so rich in diversity in the culture and the language and all of it, that it's something that we really do need to build off of. Or so what would you, how would you answer that question about the future of Head Start? I think that um, a good start would be, I mean, just piggyback on the answers already, is to recognize what we have, uh, resources already within our families, uh, what it is that they have to offer, because there is a lot for us to learn there, and that would also encourage and help to move us forward in where we want to go. Because again, uh, the children are going to be with their parents, forever. So I think that the more that we include and in really starting where they are, because parents, um, regardless of their background, we all love our children and we all want what is best for them. So we need to make sure that they are welcome and that we see them as the teachers. And what can we learn so that we can together move forward and you know just like they were saying with the partnerships there are partnerships to be built everywhere and just like I said again starting with families with the parents and the communities because at least for me I am blessed that I am in a community that I have been for a very very long time and it is very refreshing to go into trying to build something new and to see a familiar face and many times, these, again, as kids who are growing up, I may not remember them, but they do remember who I am. So I think that it is very beneficial for us to refocus in what we have and move forward in what it is that we can do better. Because absolutely, we do need to do more to bring in, especially the children that are still out in harm's way. Because for the migrant families, that's where they are. That, you know, they are not in a little home and they're just not getting the education part. They are really out uh, in the dangerous fields. So I think that, that you know, all together we can move forward. I want to go to Ginger because Ginger, you're a parent who stayed involved with Head Start despite the fact that your child is now graduated from Head Start. Um, what do you see as the future of Head Start? And you know, you're still involved in, and in particular, in partnerships with parents. Where do we go with Head Start in the future to keep parents like yourself engaged beyond the one or two years their children may be with us? Um, I'm not so sure about all that. <laughs> um, I see in in funding. I think that every child should have a Head Start opportunity. I heard that once, and it's just stuck in my head. And I think that uh, through um, the parent involvement, if I hadn't, I, I would not be sitting here today if I hadn't have had, you know, my learning consultant whisper in my ear, you know, you really should come to the parent meeting. Um, I just, the parent involvement and with the learning consultants, okay. being there, coming into your home. And staying stay, with it. And staying with it, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, I think, you know, Karen opened a really interesting conversation, too, about partnerships in the community. And what has Head Start meant to you in relationship to your communities? What is the value of Head Start with other programs and other um, you know, organizations within Head Start? Let's go through. Well, as, as far as in our community, uh, BHK Child Development, we that's one of the that's one of our big successes is the fact that we collaborate with over 300 community organizations in 10 school systems and that's been huge in our success because as an example just in as a classroom teacher the transition piece and plan that we have to take our, the preschool children and transition them into kindergarten is is very successful we're continuing to work on that process um, we collaborate so children, our local uh, doctors and dentists have even have our many of our forms there. So when parents go in there to get their dental, and, and most for most parents and children, it's the first time to the dentist, and sometimes to the doctor. So we have that set in place. So our, our collaboration is really a very successful piece, and our community is very supportive of our program as well, and and so is the school system. So, and I I do think too in looking at the. Uh, family engagement piece. What I've seen over the years is the changing dynamics of the family. And I've had so many grandparents be the parent now. And I think looking at uh, you know a broader perspective and pulling in the grandparents to making them feel uh, uh, comfortable in an arena where they have already raised their children and here they have uh, their, their children's children and sometimes their children are incarcerated or they're just not around. So supporting parents and, and grandparents and families that way. Well, I think we need to, we're getting running out of time here and we need to wrap it up. So I want to go down the, the panel and ask them to just share quickly one success story that you've personally had that impacted you in terms of your experiences with Head Start. And Ginger, why don't we talk? start with you? I would have to say last year I had the opportunity, my husband and I, because my husband also was involved with the parent committee kind of thing, we had the opportunity to come back here to Washington, D.C. for the Zero to Three conference, and we sat on the parent panel, and that was probably the highlight of all my opportunities. Only now this one takes its place. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this one definitely tops it. <laughs> the White House drops it. <laughs> okay, Karen. Um, I was selected in 2008-2009 to be a National Head Start Fellow. And that was an amazing experience. I got to come live in D.C. I brought my 12-year-old um, son and left the rest of my family at home. And we came here and got to work at the Office of Head Start and Administration for Children and Families. And I learned so much. I'm a hands-on learner, and I didn't know anything outside of Oklahoma before that. But I learned um, a lot of things, and I got to take it back to my community and, and came back to a new job as Executive Director of Educare and take it and put it to practice. So that was amazing. Lourdes? I will have to take the opportunity to say just being able to be part of so many successful stories with our children. And today, with me here today, my guest is a board member of our program and also <laughs> who we call an RCMA baby. He was in our program as a baby and then now he's on our board. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how uh, be be much you. better can that get? <laughs> There are lots of individual ones, but I guess in a broader perspective, I would like to uh, just um, recognize the fact that with our program, we have had children um, from you know infancy up to high school graduation. They've been part of our program either through our summer GE program, but who have um, graduated and had the opportunity to get a BHK Foundation scholarship. So they benefit many times over from being in our program, and I'm very proud of that with our organization. Um, one of the, the real highlights of my day is the morning when the kids come in and hearing them say which is good morning in our language is really awesome. And then one day one of the parents walked through and she said it too. So it's, it's getting that, that community of learners and um, learning the language that's really important. That's a great way to end. Well, I want to thank everyone for participating and the panelists, and congratulations to the champions. Um, well deserved. You represent a lot of people who out, are out there each and every day working very hard in this program. 
and on behalf of the administration, we thank each and every one of you, so thank you all very much. Well, thank you very much, Linda. I just, can we give our, uh, if all of our champions could just stand once more, and I want to give them all another round of applause. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your lessons, sharing your experiences and your stories, and being the change uh, for our Head Start kids and families across the country. We're so proud. I want to also recognize and thank again uh, Linda and Yvette uh, for their leadership uh, on Head Start in our administration. And I'd like to, can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> So we have an opportunity to hear from another special guest uh, here to close out our program. But before we do that, I want to uh, recognize a few important guests that we have here with us uh, in the audience today that have really um, uh, just dedicated years of their life and experience to helping move Head Start forward. Uh, and I'm going to begin with Yasmina Vinci, who's our president of the National Head Start Association. <laughs> We also have Cleo Rodriguez here uh, in the house, who's uh, president of our National Migrant and Seasonal Head Start Association. Here's Cleo. Here's Cleo. Gil Gonzalez, who's uh, president of our National Indian Head Start Association. Here's Gil. Also representing uh, our early Head Start programs. Unfortunately, Matthew Melmed couldn't be here today with us. He had another previous engagement. We have Jennifer Boss here from uh, Zero to Three. Jennifer, where are you? <laughs> Thank Jennifer for, for being here with us as well. Uh, and there's another very special uh, guest um, whose uh, work has been uh, pivotal to uh, our administration's progress. Uh, in Head Start, and that's been Dr. Joan Lombardi, who is our former Deputy Assistant Secretary. And, and Joan was really a founder uh, for the Office of Early Childhood Development at, within our uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and now with the Buffett Fund. Thank you, Joan, for all you do. Uh, and now I'm very uh, pleased to uh, welcome to the podium John Carson, who's the director of our Office of Public Engagement here at the White House. John previously served as chief of staff at our uh, White House Council on Environmental Co Quality and field director uh, for uh, the president's uh, campaign in 2008. Uh, John really is uh, the uh, focal point for our ability uh, here at the White House to reach out and engage uh, the entire uh, community, and we're really grateful that he's spending some time here uh, this afternoon addressing you all. Thanks, John. Well, thank you, Roberto. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This has been just, uh, I think, quite frankly, one of our favorite Champions of Change events as we've been planning it and talking about it to have you all here today. And I have to tell you, though, um, I'm here at the end to close our ceremony out today with an ask of all of you, uh, an ask of our audience, of those of you following along online, but I think most importantly, an ask of all of our champions, which is quite simply to tell this story. Tell the story of what you are doing to be champions of change with Head Start across the country. Each of you in the audience connected to this incredibly important program, tell your story of what you're doing. Tell the story of what you saw here today. Talk about what you liked. Talk about what you didn't like. But help us connect people to this. Um, tweet about it. If you don't know what Twitter is yet, look it up on your way home. Um, write about it, blog about it. Just grab three people in the grocery store tomorrow and tell them about Head Start and what it means to you. I, I ask you to do this for three reasons. First, we need to get these stories of our champions and the success they are having in communities across this country. What we find is that as change is made across the country, it's because someone else inspired that community to see what could be done, and, and, and so we need to get the work of our champions out across the country. 
Um, second, I, I ask you to tell the story of Head Start because right, right now, um, Head Start is under attack, quite frankly. Um, you know, we started the Champions of Change program because we knew that while there's arguments going on here in Washington about policies and laws and budgets, that as those fights are happening in, in D.C., out across the country, there were thousands of Americans like our Champions of Change making a difference in their community. But we do know the reality is that the decisions made here in Washington affect what you are able to get done. As we talked about under this president, we've seen 61,000 additional infants, toddlers, preschoolers affected by Head Start. But proposals like the budget in, in the House of Representatives would cut over 240,000 slots. So we need to make these budget arguments not some abstract accounting mechanism, but about the real stories that are on the ground. Um, but the final reason um, that I ask you all to tell the story of, of what you were involved in here today and what you are doing with Head Start across the country is that, you know, no matter what we think of the different political discussions and no matter what we think of the policy debates we're in, I think we could all agree that we need more Americans involved in the civic process. We need more Americans believing they can make a difference in their community. And so help us get the example of our champions here today out to Americans across the country so they can take a look and say, I could be that change in my community as well. So thank you um, to all who've participated today. Thanks for to all following on online, again, our hashtag is hashtag WHChamps. Uh, help spread the words. And, and one last congratulations to all our Head Start champions of change. Thank you, John. Thank you, all of you, for joining us today. Thank you for joining us online. Um, and thank you for all you do so well to really uh, strengthen uh, and improve Head Start and reach um, all of our children and families through this critical program. Uh, this concludes our program. Thanks very much. Thank you.